to introduce to you our presenters for this session. We're going to begin with Mike Train Laboratory. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Jessica. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, to you the folks that are going to be presenting today. First of all, we'll start with Nathan, the science guy, who you saw before, Dr. Brandon Barthel, Alicia Alvarez, Dr. Elizabeth Wallace, um, myself. Um, so if we can start with the, uh, the slides, I guess we can um, begin. So we are the uh, state of Florida's only genetic research and monitoring laboratory for fish and wildlife. Um, we've been in existence for about 30 years. Um, I lead the program and, and work with Dr. Sayum, as I mentioned, Drs. Wallace and Barthel, and we're assisted by a talented team of biologists, including Marian, uh, Marta, Cecilia, Alicia, Nathan, and um, Brian. So the best. So what are the things that we work on? The best way to uh, get started with that is to have a look at our tree of life, um, and we can see that um, in this tree, we work on everything from the smallest microorganisms and plants, um, things um, without a backbone, what we call invertebrates. That would include the lobsters and shrimp and scallops and oysters and of course everything with the backbone, a lot of fishes and other things. So I'm going to give you a few examples today before turning it over to our other presenters. Um, and the first example would be something that we uh, work closely on is invasive species. In the state of Florida, we probably lead the nation in the number of invasive species that we have. And that's simply this, this a species of a plant or animal that is brought into Florida from someplace else and it can be disruptive to our native uh, species and to the ecosystem in general. We've recently, for example, found a species of eelgrass in our state um, come from Asia through the uh, aquarium and pet trade. So if you go to Petco or some other places and buy grass for your aquarium, um, that's coming from someplace else. Please do not release that in your backyard creek or something else because this particular species of eelgrass has gotten loose in the state of Florida and is impacting our native species of eelgrass, which happens to be a food source for manatees, by the way. Um, the other, in terms of invertebrates, I mentioned the scallops and the shrimp and the lobsters. Uh, we're very invested in, in, in doing research on coral right now. In the state of Florida, Florida our coral are in, are in a bit of trouble due to disease, pollution, climate change, and not only just in the state of Florida, but around the Caribbean and throughout the world. So we're using in our laboratories DNA studies to uh, work with other coral biologists to restore and rescue our coral populations. Um, we're going to hear two presentations from Drs. Barthel and Wallace on fish populations and also the discovery of a new species of fish in the state of Florida. So we're excited about that. Um, we've also worked on things like ducks. And of course, one of our favorites are the manatees. Um, you, may, uh, know, you may know or may not know the closest living relative to the manatee actually happens to be the elephant. Um, and we wouldn't know that except through studies of DNA. Um, so I'm going to turn it over right now to um, Nathan, our science guy, to tell you a little bit more about how we study the DNA molecule, the chemistry of it. Um, so, Nathan, please take it away. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah, so as Mike said, today I'm going to show you how we can go from a, a tissue sample to get the extracted DNA out of it so that we can use it. Um, but first thing I want to bring your attention to is, uh, I guess, just to the right of our video screen here, we have a question for you that I want to pose. And I want to know, where do you know where in the cell is the DNA found? If you know the answer, go ahead and answer, choose the answer right now. If you're not really sure, just give your best guess, um, and I will answer that question for you in just a minute. 
And so, but first, where's DNA found in the cell? Well, what are cells? Cells are our basic unit of life. And life can range from anywhere between this small singular cellular organism as a bacteria to larger multicellular organisms like plants and animals. And here I want to give you a little bit of a background on some cell biology and some of the components within the cell. Just going to share my screen. Yeah. All right, so I'm taking you to this web page. Hopefully you all can see it right now. Now this will give us an animation of different animals or plant cells. Now, I don't have time to go through all these with you today, but in your own time, I challenge you to go through and look at the plant cells and compare that to animal cells and see if you can determine which of these organelles, all these little components in here are called organelles, determine which of these are in plant cells and animal cells and which are in just one or the other. Also at the top here, there's a bacterial cell model you can compare them to. But going back to the animal cell here really quick, I want to just point out a few organelles. One is the cell membrane. This is going to be important in our DNA extraction because we need to open up those cell membranes in order to get to our DNA. Um, and then that brings me to answer our polling question. Where is the DNA located? It is located in the nucleus. The nucleus is also membrane bound. And so we'll have to open up that to get to our DNA as well. So now let me switch back to my slides. All right, and now I'm going to bring up a video for you guys that will give you a peek into the laboratory and our DNA extraction process. We'll extract DNA from tissue in the form of a fin clip. Now we don't need a lot of tissue to extract DNA, so I'm just going to cut off a small bit of this and save the rest. Here's the fin clip. So I'm going to need to cut just what I need off. Now this is about all I need. And now I'm going to put this in the cell isis solution. Pertinase K, which will help break open the cells and digest the proteins within them. Next, a vortex to mix it up. And now we'll incubate at 56 degrees overnight. protein precipitation solution to all of our samples. This will help grab all the cellular components and proteins and pull it down out of solution so that only our DNA is left. Now it's time to take them for a spin. The centrifuge will spin our samples really fast so all the proteins and cellular components will get pulled down to the bottom of the tube and separated from our DNA. Now our sample is nicely separated with a pellet of our proteins and other cellular components at the bottom and our DNA in the solution at the top. Now the next step is to pour off the solution we want to keep and throw away the rest. Now the question is, how do we get our DNA out of solution? We'll add another chemical called glycogen. Glycogen will bind to our DNA and allow us, when we centrifuge it again, to pull the DNA down out of the solution. Now we have our DNA in a nice pellet at the bottom of the tube. Now we need to drain the tube and let the pellet dry. Now we have a dry DNA pellet in the bottom of our tube. Our last step is to rehydrate the DNA. Now our DNA is rehydrated. We're ready to sequence it with our genetic analyzer. Alright, 
well hopefully that gave you a good overview of what a DNA extraction is like. Now I'd like to turn it over to Alicia Alvarez who will explain how we use DNA to study manatees. Thank you, Nathan. Hi, everyone. I'm Alicia, and today I will be discussing individual identification and manatee genetics. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. So the Manatee Genetics Project works with photo identification to determine individual manatees. Photo ID uses photography and unique scar patterns to identify individuals. But what if an animal doesn't have scars or the water's too murky to get a good photograph? That's where genetics comes in. And Jessica, this will be the video portion. Thank you. So when the water cools in winter, manatees move into warm water sites to stay warm. These areas are important for their survival and include natural and artificial sources such as Florida springs and power plant discharge canals. Manatees gather in these areas in large numbers, sometimes in the hundreds, which provides a great opportunity to sample manatees. So how do you take a tissue sample from a wild manatee? Well, <laughs> fun fact, adult manatees weigh an average of 1,000 pounds, which is roughly a large vending machine. Furthermore, manatees can swim at speeds over 15 miles per hour, which means they can safely outswim our most athletic scientists. The top speed for Olympic swimmers is 6 miles per hour. So to sample manatees safely and cause minimal disturbance for the animal, a group of trained researchers use a boat and trolling motor to get close. Then a tiny needle placed at the end of a long pole is used to take a tiny skin sample or biopsy from the manatee. Each sample is given a unique ID and is processed in the lab. Next, we compare their genotypes to see how often we sample the same individuals over time. In this figure, we are comparing genotypes from three wild manatees, A, B, and C, to determine whether any of the animals are the same or different. You will see that manatees A and C have the same genotype at all four markers shown. If their genotypes are the same at all 36 markers, they are determined to be the same individual. Why is this important? By identifying individuals, and tracking their survival, we can determine if the population is increasing or decreasing. If the population is decreasing, we can make sure that we are not losing too many manatees too quickly from their biggest threats, including cold stress, red tide, and watercraft collisions. If needed, we can act in ways to reduce these threats and further promote conservation. And so earlier, your uh, polling question was a true or false? And it looks like the majority of you got it right. Uh, by identifying individuals in a population and tracking their survival over time, scientists can determine whether the population is increasing or decreasing. And indeed, that is true. So good, good job, everyone. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wallace. Thank you, Alicia. Hi, everybody. So next up, I'm going to briefly talk to you a little bit about another kind of um, work that we do in our laboratory, and that is studying um, populations using genetics. So you have probably noticed that um, each of us is a little bit unique, um, but also people share many different traits, things like eye color and height and hair color are not unique for every single individual person. So many of those kinds of characteristics are shared among us. So if you think about those kinds of shared traits, you might think, well, that could make up a population in a way. And so the same thing is true with fish and wildlife, that um, with 
within any particular species, if we look at all of their DNA, yes, we could tell them apart, as Alicia, Alicia just explained, and each one would be unique, but they also share many traits. So in um, like a fish species, that might be something like their growth rate, their color, and their pattern. So these are tools that we can use to study them. So on the right hand, on this screen, you'll see there's some circles. And the big one has lots of circles in it, but there are two different kinds. Some are red and some are blue. So let's pretend that those are gag grouper in Florida water. Now what would happen if some of those grouper decided to move and start living in Tampa Bay? And then some of the other ones decided to move and start living in Naples and Sarasota. Well, if those individuals stay in those new locations, Tampa Bay and the other areas that they move to, if they stay for the rest of their life and they reproduce there and their offspring stay there, then over lots and lots of generations, the individuals in Tampa Bay would start to be a little more similar to each other than they would be to the others. So they're still the same species, they haven't changed that much, but they have some shared characteristics with each other that may not um, exist in the other locations. So what do we do with this kind of information? Well, at FWC, our um, scientists like ourselves study these various population traits along with lots of other things. And then we share that information with our management team and FWC managers use the information to create regulations. And this process helps us conserve healthy wild populations. So the polling question I asked, um, do you think that Red Drum and Tampa Bay belong to a unique population, one shared around all Florida, South Florida only, or the entire Gulf of Mexico? Well, it looks like we had some mixed results, and that's not too surprising, because unless you're a really avid angler and you follow management regulations really, really carefully for Red Drum in particular, you might not already know this. But you can look up this information. In fact, if you fish a lot, you should. But for red drum, what we actually have are three distinct regions around the state. So this is based on information that we obtained using genetics, as well as a lot of other research that um, different groups did for FWC. And they decided the best management approach for red drum was to break up these three zones based on differences. So the red drum in the panhandle in the northwest are a little bit different from red drum found in Tampa Bay and the rest of Florida. So the, the Tampa Bay red drum are actually most similar to that southern group, which actually makes up most of the state. So next up, Brandon is going to tell you a little bit more about some of our projects. Okay, thank you, Liz. All right, so I'm going to show you guys how genetics can be used to identify different species. And I'm going to be using an example that involves black bass. Black bass are a group of freshwater fish that are very popular because people like to fish for them. And there are lots of black bass anglers across the country, and many of them are in Florida as well. And there are six different black bass species that exist in Florida. So this study involves a group of fish that are found in five rivers in the north uh, western part of Florida, in the Florida Panhandle, which you see here in orange. These fish look very much like spotted bass that are found here in the Mississippi River drainage. But there are two other species, Alabama bass and shoal bass, that are located just to the east and west of them. So which species do these fish belong to? All four of the candidate species have very similar body shapes and pretty similar coloration patterns. But as geneticists, we know that members of one species are more genetically related to each other than they are to the other species. So we use genetics to find out which species these unknown specimens were most closely related to. So Nathan showed you a little bit about uh, the work that we do in the lab, including the DNA extractions and the sequencing work, and that's what we did for this project. We sequence sections of the genome. 
And this allowed us to compare the DNA sequences carried by our unknown specimens to the sequences from the known species. Now, DNA sequences consist of four bases, which you see here, A, C, T, and G. And these bases make up the DNA molecule. And for the rest of uh, my presentation, uh, the, there are different bases are going to be represented by the different colored letters, which you see here. Now, when you compare the DNA sequences, you can see that different species have unique bases at different sites within the DNA. For example, Alabama bass had a G at site 1, while the others all had Ts. And when we compared the sequences of the unknown specimens to the known species, we found that they had two sites in their DNA sequence that were different from all the other species that we examined. In fact, all the other black bass species. One way to look at genetic relationships is to use a tree diagram, and this groups individuals based on their genetic similarity. So here we have numerous sequences from uh, fish from, from each of the known species and the unknown specimens, and they are included in this analysis. And you can see the members of each of the known species down here form tight clusters that were separated from each other. We found out that our unknown specimens did so as well. They're in the upper part of the tree. And this is evidence that they were genetically distinct from the other species. It's evidence that they very well may be a new species of black bass. And we've done additional work, including genetics and looking at morphology, that has proven that they are, in fact, a different species that has never been discovered before. Now, we have named this new species the Choctaw bass, and we're trying to share our, our discovery with other scientists and as well as the general public. So I'm glad we were able to share it with you guys today. Now, here's a map of the southwest, uh, southeastern United States, and the Choctaw bass range is here in orange. But all these other colored and patterned areas are different black bass species. So there are many unique spe species living near each other. Now, what this means is if someone catches a bass in one river and moves it to another, it's very likely that they'll be mixing two species together, one of which doesn't belong in the, in the released river system. And this can be very bad because two species can hybridize and change the genetic composition of the population. So it is very important not to move fish between water bodies when you are fishing. Doing so can destroy fish populations that you are trying to catch. So if there is one of the main things you want to take away from this presentation is to leave the, the fish and animal animals that you interact with in nature, leave them where you found them and, and try not to move around because that mixing can cause big problems for us when we're trying to conserve these species. All right, so now I'm going to wrap up by looking at our poll results, how many fish species are found in uh, Florida freshwater, and it looks like most of you, 71%, got the right answer. There are 250 different fish species that are found in Florida freshwaters. And I just want to point out that 75 of those, so almost 30% of those species, are non-native species that have been released into Florida. And some of these are sport fish, like there's one bass species that's non-native, but a lot of them are also aquarium fish. People have brought in to use in their aquariums or fish farms and, and end up releasing them in the wild. So that's another way that we can all be aware of, of not doing that, making sure that if we have pet fish, that we keep them in our house and, and definitely do not ever let them be released in the wild. Okay. So thank you. All right, Mike, Nathan, Alicia, Liz, and Brandon, thank you so much for sharing your genetics research with us. Bring everybody back on, including myself. So it is now time for the Q&A portion of our session. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the pod. We did receive a couple of questions before our session, so we'll go ahead and start with those. Our first question is, can we make a new type of fish? I would like uh, Dr. Barthel to answer that, because one of the ways to make different kinds of fish are to uh, make different species or crossbreed different species. So Brandon, what can you tell us about that? So when you take two species and they are allowed to mate together, you end up with a hybrid or an integrate species. A, it's, a, it's a set of fish that have genomes from the two parental species. So they, they would not exist in nature if they were the result of humans actually mixing them together. So that's one way where you can create a new genetically uh, composed fish by mixing two species together. I don't know if that's the angle the question was trying to get at. 
But, um, you know, that's something that happens in nature between fish species. But what we're really concerned about is when it happens unnaturally by people moving fish where they don't belong. Thank you. Okay, our next question. Um, can their DNA create cures or medicines? Okay, I'd like to feel one. this one. Oh, go ahead, Liz. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was just thinking that um, I don't know of any cures or medicines that are used entirely or composed entirely of, of like a fish species. But there are components that are used for a lot of different things. Like um, some people take supplements that um, are just fish oil. And fish oil is actually used in a lot of cosmetics. Um, and it's even used as um, part of a component in some vaccines. So all of the medical researchers that are actually trying to create a vaccine um, to prevent us from getting the new COVID-19 virus, um, some of those are actually going to use a component that's made from fish oil. So it can make up a part of some cures. That's exactly right. Um, another example I was thinking of, um, and we have some researchers here in the state of Florida at Nova University who are studying the DNA of sharks. And it turns out sharks have a very low incidence of cancer um, compared to any other animal, and the question is why? And by studying the DNA, they've actually found out that sharks have a very efficient DNA repair mechanism. A lot of cancer starts out with a mutation due to a uh, carcinogen, um, UV radiation, things like that. And sharks don't seem to be susceptible to that because of their ability to repair their DNA. And so perhaps we can uh, take a lesson from the sharks eventually and, and figure out how we can uh, develop some therapeutics to, uh, that can repair our DNA. So that's another example of this. So maybe Google Nova University and sharks and cancer if you want to learn a little bit more about this. Right. Our next question, um, how can we keep their habitats? So Alicia, do you have any uh, uh, input on uh, per perhaps about plastics and rivers and in the ocean? Sure. So I think we all can play a part in keeping the habitat clean by recycling and being responsible. So one of the biggest issues I've run into personally um, when visiting a beach would be seeing trash wash up on the shore or even seeing animals entangled in fishing lines. So when you're out fishing and you break off on an object, you know, you want to try to get in your fishing line and try to dispose of it properly. Um, if you see trash on the beach, definitely be the bigger person and pick it up and dispose of it properly. Um, we all can play a big part by recycling at home and just being responsible with our trash. We have time for one more question. Mike, do you want to take a look in our uh, Q&A pod and sure. maybe grab? I see the question, when did we find out about this new bass? And we're very excited about that. Um, it's one of two species that uh, we've discovered uh, new species in this laboratory. Um, we found that bass quite by accident. Um, probably in about 2007, we were studying the shoal bass, which uh, Brandon had in his presentation. Um, and we were trying to, we we're doing genetic studies of the shoal bass. And it turns out that we found something was crossbreeding with those shoal bass. Um, and, and we could not figure out what it was. The signal did not match in its DNA, did not match any other bass species. Um, so it took a, a long time. We're, we're already you know, more than 10 years into this process. It takes a very long time to, uh, to identify and to uh, nail down all of the science around identifying and naming a new species. Um, but we're almost there. And uh, we're very excited about the about our, our brand new species of bass in the state of Florida. So good question. All right, well, thank you everyone for all of your wonderful questions. I do apologize if we were not able to get to um, your question today. That will actually bring us to the end of our session. So to 
Mike, Nathan, Brandon, Alicia, and Liz, thank you so much again for taking the time to join us today um, and, and share the world of genetics research with all of us. Thank you, it's our pleasure. Pleasure. And thank you all of you for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.